All right. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, early morning for some people, it looks like. Uh, my name is Brandon Weston. I'm an Ozark healer, writer, folklorist uh, living in Northwest Arkansas area. And I'm the author of the book Ozark Folk Magic Plants, Prayers, and Healing from Llewellyn. Came out in January. And today we're going to be talking about Ozark witches. And it's a little bit of a complicated subject. Um, if anybody knows anything about Ozark folk magic or folk magic in general, a lot of times these are these are complicated subjects that have a lot of twists and turns, complicated history. And of course, with the Ozarks, there's a there's a difference between you know, what we what we talk about when we mention the old Ozarks and what we mention or what we talk about when we talk about the, the modern Ozarks. So the Ozarks has gone through a, a great amount of change over the past, you know, 200 years um, since land opened up in the area after the Indian Removal Act and people started flooding into the mountains. And so it's gone through a lot of changes and that has affected the folk magic of the area. It's a, it's affected the practices of healing in the area, um, as well as just folk ways in general. And so we, I'm kind of dividing up this presentation into past and present, and that's very intentional because witches have been perceived in very different ways in the past and the present. So before we get into talking about witches, let's talk about the Ozarks. So this is the region that we are talking about when we say the Ozark Mountains. And it's divided up into a few different plateau areas. Um, a lot of people have associations of the Ozarks being just in Arkansas. And as you can see by the map, that's, that's not the case. The Ozarks extends well up into Missouri, even over into Kansas and Oklahoma. The Ozark people are really an amalgam of a lot of different cultures a lot of different traditions. So it's not just one thing. We can't just say, you know, Ozark folk magic is this, Ozark folk magic is that. We really have to kind of piece things apart. And when we start to piece things apart, we see that there are so many different cultural fingerprints on, on our Ozark folkways. Um, Ozark people come from Appalachia. Um, most recently. Uh, and the Ozarks are still considered a part of the greater Appalachian cultural region. So whenever I give lectures and talks, I always tell people, you know, if you're wondering about an Ozark tradition and you can't find any information about it, try looking at Appalachian sources because chances are there's going to be a, a deep connection there. Uh, we, we really are still to this day sister cultures. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of our folkways that, well, most of our folkways were actually developed within the Appalachian Mountain region. And then, you know, this it, in Appalachia, this was a, an amalgam of cultures too. So you have uh, influences coming from the British Isles. You have uh, the Celtic influences. You have a strong amount of German influence. And all of these influences would have sort of mixed together and then also mixed with uh, African traditions from the slaves. It would have mixed with indigenous traditions from the people of the Southeast. And so this sort of created this hill folk culture, this, this melting pot culture of a lot of different practices and beliefs and traditions. And then all of this would have come with hill folk families and communities to the Ozarks in around 1820 or so. There were families that came before that, um, but they were few and far between. Really the, the push into the Ozarks began with the Indian Removal Act, when unfortunately the Osage, who were the indigenous people of the Ozarks at that time, they were forcibly removed to Oklahoma. This opened up land for anybody brave enough, or some would say anybody stupid enough, to uh, travel all the way from their 
you know, Appalachian homeland to, to the Ozarks. These people would have come as small family groups, small communities. They didn't come as cities. They didn't come as towns to begin with. Uh, they would have come in and they would have settled in the mountain areas and coming from Appalachia, they would have already known how to survive. Uh, it would have felt very at home for them. And so the hill folk would have settled in the mountain areas um, and began starting communities and, and families and things like that. And then later on, once the land was opened up more, um, the valley folk, as they're called, came in, which were mostly farmers. Most of them were more wealthier than the hill folk. Uh, they came into the areas and settled along the rivers in the valley areas, the fertile farmland areas. And they began building up communities and towns. So this division between the valley folk and the hill folk has always been a very sort of contentious relationship. Uh, the hill folk have always been viewed as being backward, uneducated. It's where our, the hillbilly stereotype in the Ozarks comes from. Um, and to some extent also in Appalachia, you see this too, the, the separation between the town folk, the valley folk and the hill folk, the people that live out in the mountains. And so in the Ozarks, this relationship created a lot of problems uh, and still creates a lot of problems today. The hill folk were often seen as being primitive, being closer to nature. They were often considered, you know, uh, to some extent mystical or magical, this sort of innate magic. And all of that stems back to the um, suspicion and distrust of the wilderness, of the forested areas. And th so the valley folk were looking at these sort of dangerous mountain places and they were seeing these people not just living there, but thriving there. And so it made them question why they were thriving. And so a lot of beliefs rose up about hill folk being, you know, in line with the devil, uh, hill folk being in line with the little people, as we call them in the Ozarks, or the fairies, uh, or just, you know, spirits of the land in general. And so the hill folk have always kind of had these strange uh, associations, these strange sort of connotations. Um, and that has bled over a lot into the folklore record. Um, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about the folklore. When you begin looking at Ozark folkways, probably the first thing that you encounter is Vance Randolph, who's over on the, the left there, and then also the left on the, that top photo. He's standing with Otto Ernest Rayburn, who was another famous Ozark folklorist. These are probably, Vance Randolph's probably the one that you know about if you know of any Ozark folklorists. Uh, he w is, the most famous because he's the most widely read. Um, he was pretty much, uh, him and Otto Ernest Rayburn were the only ones to publish popular works about the Ozarks. Um, so oh, Vance Randolph published a book called Ozark Magic and Folklore, um, which still to this day is used as a guidebook for both researchers and practitioners alike um, when looking at specifically traditions of folk magic and healing and witchcraft in the Ozarks. And so basically Vance Randolph, uh, he would go out into the hills, sometimes with his wife, Mary Parler, who's in the bottom photo. They would go out into the hills with recording materials. Um, sometimes they'd have to take them in by mule um, because no vehicles could get back into the hills. So they would go out and they would interview people and they would record stories and they would, you know, uh, compile all of this information. And then Mary Parler never actually published her information. She, she has a, a folk song collection as well as a, a huge collection 
that's only in special collections here at the University of Arkansas called Folk Beliefs of Arkansas. Vance Randolph, on the other hand, published, he, and he published widely. So he not only published Ozark Magic and Folklore, he published books of stories as well, um, books of jokes, things like that. He also wrote a lot about, you know, history and language. And he quickly became um, the sort of expert on the Ozarks. And this is problematic. <laughs> this is, uh, it's, uh, it's very helpful in that, you know, the foundation of what we have today, as far as Ozark folklore and folk magic goes, we, we you know, we owe a debt of gratitude to these, these folklorists like Vance Randolph. But I always tell people, you know, Ozark, folk, Ozark magic and folklore, it's a good book. You know, it's a good book to have. I have a copy of it. I read it often. But you have to understand it was first published in 1947 and it was published under the name Ozark Superstitions. And so when you're reading through it, even though he collected this material firsthand and he went about it in a very good way, sometimes, uh, he still approached these beliefs as being superstitions, not as being living traditions. So he still had that outward gaze of the folklorist. He was an academic. He was writing not from the perspective of a practitioner or even really somebody from within the culture itself. He was documenting. He was collecting. And this, is, uh, this has been sort of the problem with what we have about the Ozarks. Um, since Vance Randolph, nothing has been published about Ozark magic until I came out with my book. And that's one of the purposes of the book is to update the story to say, you know, where, where are we today with the Ozarks? You know, what, how are our traditions still alive? The, are the things that Vance Randolph and Mary Parler collected still relevant? Or, you know, have they been replaced by something else? Something better, maybe. Um, so that was the main intention with the book. And it's, uh, you know, basically all of my own collections. But it's different because I, I am also a witch. I'm a practitioner. Um, I, I've been able to view these practices in a very different light than the folklorists have been. Um, and that's been a real driving force for my project for years now. I'm a multi-generational Ozarker. I should have said that in the beginning. Um, all my family's from here. My parents are from here, grandparents, great-grandparents. Before that, most of my family was from Appalachia. So mostly Tennessee and Kentucky. Um, some Georgia, North Carolina as well. So I, this is very much a living tradition for me. I grew up with, you know, strange family stories. Um, I grew up with some traditions and, and practices that not a lot of other families probably had. Um, my, I had a great uncle, my, my dad's dad's brother, who was a wart charmer. Uh, so he could actually buy warts off of people. So if you had a wart, you'd come up and say, Uncle Bill, I have a wart. And he'd give you a penny or a dime and you'd take it. And then overnight, your warts would go away. So I grew up with this stuff, but never really thought anything of it. It was just kind of day-to-day -day life. And then when I was in college, I took a folklore course and we read Vance Randolph. And so I got to read in Vance's book where he collected stories about wart charmers. And something clicked in my mind and I, I just said, you know, I've got to learn more about this. I've got to figure out, you know, how my family fits into this, you know, patchwork quilt of Ozark folk belief. And I, I want to find out how people across the Ozarks, you know, have changed and where we are today. So the uh, Ozark folk magic folk accounts are really dominated when it comes to witchcraft. We're really dominated still by the old stereotypes that were brought in with European settlers. And so I'm sure if anybody has researched into, you know, the history of witchcraft in Europe and also early America, you will probably know some of these stereotypes. In the Ozarks, uh, there was a very firm separation between the role of the healer and the role of the witch. And as a healer, you never wanted to cross that line. Um, 
to my knowledge in the Ozarks, there have never been any major sort of witch hunts or witch trials, but on an individual community basis, there have been a lot of people ostracized and victimized by communities because of witch accusations. It's, it's definitely, it's a part of our folk record. Um, Mary Parler has stories collected from people who had family members who were killed because they were accused of being witches, things like that. In Ozark folk belief, there, there's this idea of this sort of neutral magic in the world. And this neutral magic can be manipulated by people who have what's called the gift. And the gift can come to somebody in lots of ways. Typically, a person is born with the gift, and people know somebody is born with the gift because there's certain tokens or signs that around their birth that would point toward them having this power or being able to manipulate this power in the world. And I say this power is neutral for good reason. And we'll, we'll kind of talk about that a little bit later with modern witches. Um, so these people who can manipulate this power, typically they are born with the power, but there are other ways of gaining it. So people have found the power. Um, there are stories of people, healers, you know, who were normal people. They went out into the woods and heard a voice or saw a spirit or saw the little people. And through this interaction with these sort of otherworldly entities, they somehow gained the gift. And usually there's an exchange involved. If anyone has read anything about fairy lore, you know that there's always an exchange and sometimes it's not... Yeah, you don't always get the better end of the deal. And so people can also um, be gifted these powers as well from other individuals. So there's a tradition of healers passing down this power. Um, when they enter a sort of retirement in old age, they may pass it to um, a child or a grandchild or an apprentice. Um, and so they can pass it through those lines. Um, Traditionally, in Ozarks, you can also um, be a witch. And so we, we have to make a distinction here between the what I, what I call traditional Ozark folk belief and modern Ozark folk belief. So traditional folk belief, you, you kind of have to place it in the, that old Ozarks, which is before the 50s, 60s. Um, much more conservative, much more based in, in Christian, Protestant Christian systems. It's much more based in these old stereotypes that were inherited from mostly European sources about witches. Uh, so kind of make that distinction in your mind as I'm talking about this, this stuff. So there's this neutral magic in the world and there are those that can manipulate it. The only difference between the healer and the witch is in how they manipulate this power. Traditionally, the healer always heals and the witch always hurts. That's, that's been the traditional view of, of witchcraft for, you know, since the beginning, since people brought these beliefs over from Europe. This idea that the witch, the role of the witch is they steal from people, they hurt people, they maim people, and in some cases they kill people. So that is how the witch has been seen as, you know, using this power. Whereas the healer or the doctor um, or the granny woman in the community, they use that same power, but for good, quote unquote good, which is to heal, to bless, to cleanse, things like that. That has been the traditional division of, uh, of witch and healer in the Ozarks for uh, a long time now. Um, but, you know, this isn't entirely the truth. Um, these stories, these folk tales about witches and healers have been developed by non-practitioners for the most part. So we have folklorists who are non-practitioners perpetuating these stories. We have community members creating these stories and accounts, but they themselves are not practitioners. And that's a very important key point to make that 
we there's a significant lack of stories from practitioners themselves. And this is, uh, it makes sense uh, when you're looking at the old Ozarks because it's self-preservation. You know, uh, in, in many cases, Ozark folk magic is as diverse as the people are. These traditions are based in family lineages. So from one family to another, you have very different practices a lot of the times, very different beliefs. But there's this sort of overarching connection of Ozark identity, which sort of holds everything together. So you know, because these practices are so diverse through families, they're very often very secretive for these practices. So you don't want to talk about who you are, um, first of all, because you don't want to draw attention to yourself. You don't want to be accused of being a witch. You don't want people to, you know, <laughs> look at you more than they have to. But it's also to preserve the integrity of the work itself. So in a lot of cases, practitioners won't talk about themselves. They won't tell stories about themselves unless they trust you or unless it's somebody, you're somebody that, you know, they're hoping to pass their practice on to. So this has been the dominating image. Uh, and it, to some extent, it still is today, not amongst practitioners again, but amongst people who are getting interested in Ozark folklore. When you pick up Vance Randolph's Ozark Magic and Folklore, he has a chapter called Ozark Witchcraft. And the entire chapter is perpetuating all of the stereotypes of the witch that we inherited from conservative Europe, from, from the Middle Ages, basically. So he talks about people believing that, you know, you can tell if somebody is a witch by putting a nail in their chair. And if they sit on the nail and it hurts them, then they aren't a witch. But if they sit on the nail and nothing happens, then they are a witch. So these are, these are really, really outdated beliefs, very stereotypical beliefs of the witch um, that have been perpetuated by folklorists for some time now. The reality is uh, very different though. Um, so this is a part of that perpetuating from, from the folklorists. So this is actually a spread in Life magazine, 1939, um, called Ozark Superstitions. And this was, this, they worked with Vance Randolph, who, again, remember, he's, he's the foremost, you know, Ozark folklorist at the time and still to some extent today. Um, so these were photos of Ozark superstitions that he put into this spread. And so you see an Ozark witch woman and it, it's showing her making her spite doll, which is used to hurt, you know, an enemy, a sort of, you know, voodoo doll. We call them spite dolls, but you know, this, <laughs> this is only one perspective and it's from the folklorist, the non-practitioner. Uh, spite dolls have been used as a part of sympathetic magic, not just to curse people, but also to heal people remotely as well. And then this is an, the, on the right is an altar, a witch altar that he supposedly reproduced from one that he saw. And uh, so this one is, is working for some love magic and stuff. The problem is that, um, again, these are not practitioner accounts. These are not accounts from the people themselves. These are uh, accounts from outsiders, um, and in many cases, Vance Randolph just made things up. <laughs> in many cases, uh, uh, just made up informants, made up stories, things like that. So it's very problematic and has been for some time. Uh, the reality of the witch is very different. The reality is that this neutral magic that I talked about earlier, this neutral force in the world, uh, was m used by individuals with the gift, individuals with the power in uh, very, you know, diverse ways. And so uh, these are a couple, uh, what I would call modern witches. A lot of people today are reclaiming the term for themselves, which is very exciting. The image of the witch has changed over the years. Um, it doesn't hold the same weight in the Ozarks as it used to, or I should say it doesn't hold the same negative connotations as it used to. Um, there are still communities that view witchcraft as always being evil, always being uh, 
of the devil, things like that. But more often than not, you see people, you know, that are reclaiming the term. So I've met heal local healers and communities that call themselves village witches, that call themselves kitchen witches, that, you know, are proud of that. And, uh, the, you know, they have the community support. The, the reality of magic in the Ozarks is that there has never been, there's never been this division between healer and witch. They, the, the healer more often than not also works in similar ways as was accused of the witch. So in, in one case, uh, a healer I met gave me a very good example or metaphor to use of nature. So the healer can, in connecting with this neutral power of the world uh, works as nature works. So what she said is, you know, when lightning strikes your house and it catches on fire, is that evil? Is that an evil act? If a flood comes through and floods your field, is that evil? What evil did that then? And so it's, it's this idea that we can't really place these good and evil terms on nature itself. And practitioners who are able to manipulate that neutral magic in the world, they often see themselves as uh, extensions of nature, as, you know, doing what nature does. And this manifests in, in different ways. Um, so to go back to modern witches, so this on the, the left is my, my great uncle Bill, the wart charmer. On the right is Ella Dunn. She was a famous uh, granny woman and healer from Missouri. And so this is the reality of the situation, that healers were normal people. And the only thing that really made a healer into a witch was the community, was the accusations from the community. And if the community wanted to perpetuate those old stereotypes of the witch. But more often than not, the witch never existed in reality. The, the witch, as, as those stereotypes existed, they, 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 they were never around. They were only the product of... Uh, fireside stories and campfire stories. The reality is that healers existed. People, practitioners, magical practitioners existed. And they worked in a very a diverse, uh, diverse amount of ways. Um, one way it's, this is manifested in modern world is through retribution magic. So rather than somebody cursing, um, I, I more often than not see healers who work in retribution. So if, uh, if there's a violent situation between two people, um, rather than cursing the, the person who is, who, who is being violent against somebody, they, they may do work, magical work to make those consequences manifest for that person. And more often than not, healers view this as a form of sort of karmic retribution or uh, transformation. So the idea being that uh, by showing this person the consequences of their actions, that person will then change, hopefully. So healers do this with their enemies too. I've had encounters in my own practice with, uh, you know, I've had many enemies turned into friends through, through magical work like this. Um, so when we talk about Ozarks, Ozark witches, past and present, really we, we have to make a firm separation, separation between the past and the present, but we have to remember that uh, the witches of the past were manifestations of the conservative community they lived in. They, they didn't necessarily exist in and of themselves. They were more often than not as we see in other witch cases around the world, they were more often than not people who were already marginalized members of the community. So that includes women, that includes people of different races, uh, gender identities, sexual identities. They were already marginalized people that were further marginalized by the community for whatever reason. There are stories about healers quickly overnight becoming witches just because they had one client who was dissatisfied with their work and spread around town that they killed people or stole babies away, things like that. The reality of the situation is that healers have always been around and these people who have this sort of connection to the magic of the world around them, um, luckily today don't have to walk such a fine line uh, you know, uh, between the witch and the healer.
Um, in many cases, the Ozarks hasn't changed, but it, luckily that is one of the areas that it has vastly improved. So where I'm reaching the end of my time here, I just wanted to give people some information about how to find me. If you have any other questions about Ozark folk magic or healing or want to join one of my other classes, you can find me at ozarkhealing.com. Also have a Facebook account, Ozark Healing Traditions, and an Instagram at Ozark Healing Traditions. And of course, the book, Ozark Folk Magic, Plants, Prayers, and Healing. It's a really good place for people to start, not only if you're an Ozarker or you know if you're interested in folk magic traditions in general, this is a good sort of beginner's guide uh, and there's a lot of theory. And if you are an Ozarker, welcome. I encourage you to, um, you know, sift through all of the, the, the horrible things that people say about Ozarkers and really uh, dig down and start, you know, embracing your heritage, embrace your culture. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to help you along with that. So thank you for, uh, for coming. I hope it was an interesting talk and I, I hope you enjoy all of the rest of the uh, Llewellyn talks that are coming up.